twisted sketch of the man was circulated. The police received 3,500 tips and compiled a list of potential suspects named Ted. Bundy's name was among them. The name Ted was brought up. I never made the connect at all. You only met the monster through his acts. Between 1973 and 1974, the monster had been working for the King County Law and Justice Planning Office, where he was preparing a study on rapists and their victims. He was also secretly studying the procedures the police were using to try and catch him. By October 1974, five more bodies had been found, but most of them had decomposed or were just scattered bones. Bundy had left no clues, and he was long gone. Two months earlier, he had been accepted to the Utah University School of Law, but he could not stop himself from killing. The Ted Bundy that we knew was not a murderer, but maybe an hour later, he was. That's the awful part. Though his outward mask still projected charm and sincerity, the killer underneath it was about to be revealed. Bundy would soon be identified when one of his victims escaped. By early November 1974, Ted Bundy had murdered at least 11 women in Washington and Oregon and two more in Utah, where he was now living. At the same time, he was studying law at Utah University. Probably could have easily become a lawyer if he hadn't been consumed with murder 24 hours a day. The thing is, with serial killers, they are addicted to murder. It's like any other addiction. People may try it first for a high, but you need more and more of the substance, and the substance is murder. But Bundy was about to make his first mistake. On November 8th, posing as an off-duty policeman, he tried to abduct 19-year-old Carol Durant from a shopping center. He told her someone had broken into her car and offered to help. But inside his car, he tried to handcuff her. Carol fought back, and with the handcuffs still on her wrists, was able to jump out of the car and escape. Here we have a living victim that's able to describe her abductor, describe the car, and also provide evidence with the handcuff that was still on her wrist. But the police still had no idea who her attacker could be, and Bundy was a master of disguise. He just looked different all the time. One time he'd have a beard, one time he'd have long stringy hair, one time he'd have a short haircut, and I think it varied with, you know, what he was doing at the time. As 1975 began, Bundy widened his net to include Utah, Idaho, and Colorado. He killed eight women between January and August, but there was no way to connect the murders. Since July of 1974, the Washington police had whittled down their number of suspects named Ted to 200. Bundy remained on their roster, but still, no one suspected the law student at Utah University. The disappearances come closer together, the murders come closer together, the, the orchestration is more finely tuned. But Bundy's luck was about to change. Early on the morning of August 15th, Bundy's car was stopped by a police officer in Utah. Because he had been driving erratically, his car was searched. In the midst of that investigation, the trooper found this bag. And in the bag was a crowbar, handcuffs, ski mask. So he carried his own chamber of horrors around with him. Bundy was immediately arrested on suspicion of burglary. They also found gas receipts and maps that later linked Bundy to the sites of the abductions in Colorado. And more importantly, in a police lineup, Carol Durange identified Bundy as the man who had attacked her. We were shocked. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we tried to raise money for a defense fund for him and, and tried to protect him. We couldn't believe it. They had to have the wrong guy. 
On February 23, 1976, Bundy went on trial for her attempted kidnapping. As the trial began, Bundy sat in the courtroom, totally convinced that he would be found innocent. But on the stand, Carol Durange told of her ordeal at his hands and pointed Bundy out as her assailant. He was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. While he was incarcerated, investigators linked him to the murder of Karen Campbell in Colorado. But nothing fazed Ted Bundy, even being featured as the lead story on the evening news. Have you ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. No. You know, uh, again, not in the context, I think, that you, you're speaking of. Ted was, was very self-assured uh, to the point of cockiness. Uh, even, even when the murder charges had been filed. In April of 1977, he was transferred to Colorado to await trial. There, Bundy fired his lawyers and was granted permission to defend himself in the upcoming case. Bundy had supreme confidence in his uh, intellect, in his ability to beat the system, to work the system. Even if it meant avoiding trial completely. Two months later, after casing out the court's law library, he jumped out of a two-story window and escaped. Though captured six days later, he wouldn't stay locked up for long. I've matured in the past year. Believe me, I've grown in the past year, and I've learned a lot of things about myself in the past year. My only misgivings is that I might never, be, might never be in a position to apply it, you know, on the streets where I'd like to apply it. But soon he would apply it. On New Year's Eve 1977, Ted Bundy shimmied through an air duct of the Colorado jail and walked to freedom. He went through the top of his cell, down through the jailer's apartment, out into a blizzard. Free once again, Ted Bundy would continue to kill. Ted Bundy had succeeded in a spectacular prison escape and had made his way to Florida. He was now on the FBI's most wanted list, something he must have relished. Loved it, loved it. I always said that infamy became Ted. He changed his name grew a beard, and spent his time walking the Florida State University campus in Tallahassee. I think it was about January 8th when he rolled into town, determined, as he said in his confession, uh, never to so much as jaywalk. But he wouldn't keep that resolution. Sometime after midnight on January 15, 1978, just two weeks after his escape, Bundy entered the back door of the university's Chi Omega sorority house. As his victims slept, Ted Bundy crept from room to room. He bludgeoned, raped, and killed Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. He assaulted and almost killed roommates Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. I think he went in that house to kill every single woman in it. But Bundy wasn't finished. Less than a mile away, he broke into the apartment of Cheryl Thomas. Though he savagely beat her and left her to die, she survived. She was the fifth woman Bundy had attacked that night. It's not something that's causing him guilt because he's free of that. He feels justified and entitled. After what women did to him, why shouldn't he do this to women? Three weeks later, he would kill again. His victim was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, an attractive and popular junior high school student. Kimberly was kidnapped, brutally assaulted, and killed. On February 15, 1978, a patrolman pulled over a VW bug that had been reported stolen. Ted tried to flee on him on foot. There was a struggle. There was actually a round fired, uh, and the, the officer was able to bring Ted into custody. Bundy was arrested and identified, 
Over the following months, investigators in Florida gathered evidence that tied Bundy to Kimberly Leach's murder and the murders and assaults at the sorority house. Though other states sought to extradite Bundy, his first trial would begin in Florida on July 7, 1979. You're gonna represent yourself or you're gonna get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now and that's me. Bundy acted as his own defense attorney in the Chi Omega murders. He took depositions of witnesses. He filed his own motions, and I responded to those strictly on a professional basis. But at one point, as he questioned an officer about one of the murder scenes, the jurors had a terrifying view of the real Ted Bundy. He walked toward the jury and you could see them kind of lean back in their chairs as he approached them. And he asked a few perfunctory questions of the officer and then asked him to please state with great detail what you saw when you pulled back those sheets. And there was no human being in that building or watching the TV at that time that could have thought anything other than this man wanted to relive that event. Two weeks later, Bundy was found guilty and sentenced to death for the murders of Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. In January 1980, Bundy went on trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach. Again, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. But his execution would not take place for some time. Over the next nine years, Bundy would appeal his convictions and cheat death by a series of last-minute stays sometimes only minutes before his sentence was to be carried out. Finally, after countless appeals, Bundy's date of execution was scheduled for January of 1989. To postpone his death, he told authorities that he would provide information on other unsolved cases linked to him. He gives them just enough information to get their interest, to show them that he does, in fact, know what he's talking about. And then Bundy systematically tells these investigators, you need to get with your authorities and have them contact the Florida authorities because I need more time to tell you this. This is all I can tell you today. And I need more time. If you can just uh, get the, the, the Florida authorities to agree to more time, I can provide you with all of the details. It was a desperate ploy. Uh, it was a last ditch effort, but even there, I think Bundy up until the morning of his execution, Bundy really thought that uh, he could postpone the inevitable. But he couldn't. On January 24, 1989, at the age of 41, Ted Bundy, the articulate, handsome boy next door, a man who had the capability of being virtually anything he wanted, but who instead chose to become a monster obsessed with murder, was executed in the electric chair. The real question isn't how to remember Ted Bundy, the question is how to remember all those girls. You know, right at the prime of their lives. You know, these all these kids were 19, 20 years old. They had the world by the tail, they had the future. And uh, how many families were left in this total tragedy and disarray? And unfortunately, 